Um, so, uh, hi everyone, I'm Lucy. Thank you so much for coming here. Um, it really means a lot to me. It's such an honor that you all decide to come here while there are some other really cool sessions going on. Um, so, I can only rationalize your choice in coming here by my using the clickbaitiest uh, title talk that there is. Um, and I will say that it definitely overpromises. Uh, what I am going to talk about is something that you will believe. It's not, um, it's not mind blowing at all. Um, so I just want to let you guys know what you're signing yourselves up for at the very beginning of this talk um, so that I'm not um, completely underwhelming you by the end. Um, so uh, just to just give an overview of what I'm going to be doing for the next 40 minutes, um, I'm going to be talking about um, my journey in uh, like implementing this new algorithm for this headline optimizer we use at BuzzFeed. Um, and it's going to be part like, mini tutorial, part self-reflection. Um, there's going to be some self-loathing in there as well. So hopefully you'll find something you like. Um, so I guess we can get started. OK, so that wasn't the only title uh, I generated for this talk. Um, uh, this is actually uh, also a terrible title, um, but like it's still very vague, like the last one that you just saw. But it hopefully is like slightly more precise, uh, maybe a little bit more descriptive. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, I'm going to be talking about how I optimize a headline optimizer. Fair enough. All right, so that was on the last title slide. There's another one. Um, this one also super vague, but um, maybe slightly more precise in in its description. Um, so I'm talking about the uh, successes over trials of building this optimizer. So there's a little statistics pun in there for you. Um, and I really hate the word optimizer because it just like literally doesn't mean anything. But um, this is unfortunately like the nickname that the service um, has adopted for a little bit. So you know what is BuzzFeed? Uh, we're a giant media company. We um, produce all different types of content, video content, um, written content, image, like, you know, just a lot of different types of uh, original content. And, you know, a major one of those categories of content is written content. And our written content spans, you know, a whole wide range of uh, categories and um, come in a lot of different flavors and uh, you know you'll see things that are, are like super lighthearted, uh, really funny articles to things that are like uh, you know like investigative investigative journalism pieces or um, you'll have some like you know long form essays and um, you know all these things have like at least one thing in common which is that you know when you see links for these posts anywhere whether that's on buzzfeed.com or on Facebook or on Twitter um, it usually is presented as like a card with a uh, with a title or a headline, um, and then uh, it'll be accompanied with a uh, with a thumbnail image, and that is all that's presented to you usually um, before you decide to click on something, before you, before you decide to click on it and read it. So you know this is an example of what that presentation looks like. Um, so, of course, this is super important, us for, uh, important for us at BuzzFeed to think about because, you know, we want, uh, we want to make sure that these, you know, title thumbnail cards are, you know, very attractive and that people will click on them. Um, and, you know, this is something that our writers are constantly thinking about because our writers constantly want to get a lot of traffic to their content. And our writers, um, like, we've built for them a service. It's an internal service that we call FlexPro inside BuzzFeed. Um, and it's a service that allows these writers to come up with their own variants of a title and variants of a, um, of a thumbnail image. And this service will test out all these diff every possible combination of these different title variants and different thumbnail image variants. And then basically just test them live on our website, on our own domain, on BuzzFeed.com. Um, and you know, it'll expose these different variants to different users who are on our website. And then it'll you know, uh, figure out which one is the most popular one, which one is the most attractive one. So you know, in this image, there's an example of what that, those variants might look like. Uh, well, three of, uh, I believe, nine of them. So you know, here's some shopping article about here, you know, 24 clever products, I'll make you say, why did I invent that? And there's a, you know, one, another variant of that title is 24 ridiculously clever products you'd wish, you'll wish you invented yourself. 
Um, you know, and then there's one image, one thumbnail uh, possibility is someone like grabbing their jeans, and then another one is someone I, uh, slicing a block of butter. And you know, one of the, I guess the jeans one prevailed. Um, but you know, that's just one example, uh, and this test is run on every single post that's written at BuzzFeed. Um, yeah, and then, so this image shows what that would look like when it's being tested live on our website. So, you know, if you're reading any BuzzFeed article on our website, um, there's like a right sidebar of, of all these other links that you can click on to, to read other content on our site. And, you know, this sidebar is, yeah, just a, f a running feed of other posts uh, that you can read. So, you know, there's that, there's that example again, the 24 Clever Products, um, and then that's one variant being exposed in that sidebar for, um, a hand, for a bucket of our users. And the way it works is, you know, users who come to our site, they're randomly assigned to a bucket of, um, which is basically like an exposure bucket, like, the, like they'll be randomly assigned to see just one of the nine variants that are being tested for that same post. And, you know, it, it, it functions like an A-B test, basically, like a mini A-B test for that post. Um, and um, it, just, it just tests like which variant is getting the most clicks um, across all those exposure buckets. And uh, eventually, the one with the highest uh, number of, well, the l largest CTR by some statistically significant margin is chosen as the winner. And that becomes the default fixed uh, headline and thumbnail image for that post. So here's some press about FlexPro. This is a service that's existed uh, for many years um, and it predated my existence at BuzzFeed. Um, so, you know, BuzzFeed has talked, like has proudly talked about this service. Um, like I mentioned, it just takes a few different headline and thumbnail and image configurations, tests them in real time, and spits out the best performing configuration. Um, and then some of our staff has grown to really like this service and they'll start using this as like a synonym for optimizing. So there's this very crass tweet that someone tweeted out um, where, you know, flex proing something uh, optimizes, you know, anything in life. So, okay. So um, let me just briefly describe how the, the original flex pro worked. Um, it basically, to no, you know, I'm sure to no one's surprise, it functioned like a multi-arm bandit uh, system where um, it tested all these different variants of a post by you know, using explore exploit. It'll just ex give all of these variants equal exposures on our website. They'll each like, have an equal number of users seeing that variant. And then you know, it'll decide which uh, you know, which ones have highest CTR in the beginning, which ones look most promising, and then start greedily uh, promoting that post more and more and giving more exposure to the ones that look promising um, earlier on. Um, so in that way, it maximizes clicks um, in a pretty good way. It makes sure that it's, you know, underexposing the ones that show less promise in the beginning and overexposing the ones that show more promise in the beginning. So it, it is a greedy algorithm. Um, and eventually a winner is selected and uh, this is deemed by, you know, being the, the, having the highest CTR by some significant margin. Um, and that's that. So, you know, this seems totally fine. Like, this is a great algorithm. Why is there a problem here? So this has more to do with where our product priorities are. So, you know, this algorithm is working really well for optimizing clicks on our website. But that's only a small sliver of the full picture of, you know, what, like, of driving traffic to a post. A post, um, you know, as Adam mentioned in our keynote talk, uh, panel talk, like, no one goes on, like, you know, no one types in BuzzFeed.com, or people do, but it's, it's not, like, it's not common. Like, people don't often type in BuzzFeed.com and just browse our website looking for content to read. It usually shows up on Facebook or Twitter um, in your feeds, and then that's why you click on it, or, that or because your friends are sharing it. Um, so, you know, for that reason, you know, it, you know, the biggest part of this process of, of um, driving traffic to a post is, um, you know, you test the variant, you find the winner, uh, the winning thumbnail image and uh, winning thumbnail title, and then you disseminate that winner across social media. And that's the, the major thing we wanna keep in mind. So because that third step um, is something that's very time sensitive, we wanna make sure we get our posts out as fast as possible, especially if, you know, it's like a breaking news post, we want to make sure you know, that, that, is, that it gets tested for the best headline and image as fast as possible. 
So, you know, it's no, our product focus was no longer about, like, let's drive maximum clicks on our website. It was about, let's drive maximum clicks on social media, because most of our clicks are starting to come from there anyways. Um, so, you know, for that reason, we had a need for speed. Speed was a priority. We want to make sure these uh, optimal headline uh, variants and, and image variants are getting generated as, or getting resolved as much as, as fast as possible. Um, and, you know, if we don't get, get it, um, if we don't run the post through this optimizer fast enough, um, or if the, I mean, if the optimizer doesn't resolve the test fast enough, then we have to end up disseminating the version of the post that doesn't have the, you know, the tried and tested headline and thumbnail variant. So, you know, we're really like losing potential clicks if we're disseminating the, you know, the non-optimized title and image. So, uh, for this reason, we, there was a, you know, there was a golden opportunity to try out something new. Um, and, you know, one reason we didn't just simply think, like, why don't we just, you know, well, let's just tweak this multi arm band at first. Well, the, there's like an external, there are some external factors at play that pre prevented us from being able to just work with what we had already. Um, it was, you know, something built like many years ago. It was, uh, you know, there's a lot of technical debt involved in there. It was dependent on a lot of um, old legacy systems that we were, you know, independently trying to decommission. So for this reason, there, there was a need to either just get rid of Flex Pro completely or just, uh, just reanimate it in a different form, um, completely from scratch. So with this in mind, I decided um, to look at, you know, the existing problems with the old algorithm and see what potential solutions there were for this. Um, so like I mentioned, speed was a major thing, and that was something um, that I had to keep in mind when developing this new version. So what was this algorithm? Um, the super easy to implement, decided to just maybe try this first, um, especially since we didn't have much time to just like pack together something new. Um, so I decided maybe I'll give Bayesian A-B testing a try as an alternative to multi-arm bandits. Um, so, you know, the major advantages that it has over this, aside from it just being like very easy to implement, is that it gives, um, as any A-B testing framework would, it gives maximum exposure to every variant because you're giving uniform, even exposure to all of them. Um, so you are maximizing how many trials, essentially, each variant gets. So you can achieve statistical significance pretty fast, given that you're not like choking out view, uh, impressions from you know, some variants from the very beginning. Um, so in that way, you're minimizing the duration of the test as well. It's going to perform much faster. Um, and then I also really just like, this is just like a little added bonus, but it gives really nicely interpretable results, like, which is really great um, as like, as like giving feedback to humans where, you know, our staff writers inputting all these different variants, and they want to know what kind of headline and image performs really well. So when they see this feedback, like, you know, this headline performed the best, um, you know, based on this probability, no, or it has, you know, 90% probability of being better than these other variants you generated, then, then like, that's very easy to assess for them and then learn from that. So um, those are just some of, like, the basic reasons why I decided to just try this out. Um, so just in case anyone doesn't really, like, know, is not too familiar with how this works, um, Basically, for Bayesian A-B testing, all you're really doing is, you know, you have this A-B testing framework. You, uh, you know, you collect click and impression data from every variant that you have um, as you're testing it live on the website. And then you just, you just uh, estimate the CTR distribution for them. And their CTR distributions uh, are, are um, estimated uh, based on a beta distribution um, that you fit on uh, the click and impression data. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, so basically that beta distribution maps out to the uh, probability density distribution for the CTR of each variant. And then you just calculate, just now that you have these probability distributions for the CTRs, you just calculate the probability uh, for each variant that it's better than the rest of the variants. Um, so for variant A, you just calculate the probability that it's better than variants B, C, D, et cetera. Um, and then you use these probabilities to calculate the expected loss for each for choosing uh, any one of the variants. So you calculate for variant A the expected loss that um, you that you'll get for cho from choosing variant A over choosing B, C, D, or E. So that loss will be really high if variant A is or if 
um, you're not confident that variant A is going to perform that much better, you know, if you just don't have that many trials or impressions. Um, so, you know, this is just like a very, also very interpretable um, output that you get. And it's kind of like, the, what's the possible risk associated with choosing uh, variant A versus B versus C? And then you just don't decide on a winner until its expected loss uh, falls below a certain predefined threshold. And, um, and, you know, this is also like a good way to just like make sure you're not biased or you're not like, uh, you know, making any uh, decisions too early. You just want to have a preset threshold of, of caring, as they call it, which is just how much loss to your CTR are you willing to take. Um, so this is also, this is very basic, I'm sure, for a lot of you, but just to like capture the essence of how this works. Um, what's nice about a Bayesian A-B test approach is that it's faster than using like a statistical t-test approach to A-B testing. Um, that's because, you know, if you're plotting out the CTR distributions for a blue variant versus an orange variant, like on the left side, um, you know, when you have less trials or less impressions, they're going to be pretty wide distributions. They're going to have a lot of overlap because um, you don't have that much confidence in them. But, uh, and, you know, in that case, you can kind of, like, it's pretty obvious, or not obvious, but it's like, it's pretty probable that orange will outperform blue or is outperforming blue, but there's still that overlap between the, the, their distributions that you don't want to make that conclusion yet necessarily. I don't know. Um, so, you know, the principle is that, you know, if you wait longer until more impressions come in, so, you know, multiply that by 10, um, then on the right side, you'll see that orange is like pretty definitively better than blue. But with Bayesian A-B testing, you don't necessarily need to wait that long. Um, that could take you know, many hours in, in real like, website testing. So um, we want to, you know, in this kind of scenario where there's already a certain high confidence that orange is going to outperform blue in the left side of the plot this early on in the test, like why not just resolve it there? Uh, so that's kind of part of why it works so fast. Um, OK, so this is the self-loathing part I promised. Um, I'm sure none of, I'm sure very few of you would ever make this mistake I made, but I decided, like I saw these like nice formulas for uh, estimating these you know, CTR probability distributions. I thought, oh, this is so cool. Let me just code this. Um, so, you know, I was, well, first I was like, let me derive the probability that uh, variant A is better than variant B. All right, a few hours pass, and I'm like, okay, so, um, now I have to calculate the same probability that variant A is better than B and C and D. And that was just a, that was a nightmare. And then once I did that, I was like, okay, let me try to code this. And that just became completely infeasible. Um, and uh, so I gave up on that because I should have just known at the time that I could have just done some Monte Carlo simulations. So um, which is super obvious for a lot of you. Um, but yeah, so this is just, much easier way to approach these, uh, you know, looking at these probability CTR distributions. Um, and it really just reduced this function to just three lines of code um, in Python. So this was like, like, uh, this was amazing. <laughs> so um, basically all you're doing is you're just like drawing samples from a hat. Um, you have these CTR distributions fitted for a variant A, and then you have, uh, you have one for A, and then you have a CTR distribution for B. And then you just pull random samples from A's distribution and B's distribution. And then the number of times that A beats B in your random draw, is uh, you just average that across all your iterations, and that's just the probability that A is better than B, um, which is so much more simplified. Um, and then you just choose you know, whatever number of iterations that you want. Um, so like I did like 1,000 or 10,000. And then that also <laughs> simplifies multivariant comparison too, where you're calculating probability that A is better than B and C and D, just super easy. And then from there, it's also just super easy to calculate the expected loss. So like I mentioned, when you're making any decision, that comes with a risk. And um, in this, I like to think of this as like calculating the worst case scenario of choosing any variant as the winner. So you know, when you choose variant A as the winner, Yes, it might have the best CTR, average CTR so far out of all the variants, the other variants for that post. But you know, if you just don't have that many trials, uh, or, by which I mean impressions uh, in your test so far, your confidence is not going to be that high. So the worst case scenario could be pretty bad. 
And this is just a way to easily calculate that what that worst case scenario is, um, and it's super interpretable as well. The basic gist of this is that you're also doing this Monte Carlo simulation thing. You're randomly drawing from every variant CCR distribution. Anytime the, um, uh, you know, if you're calculating the expected loss of variant A, anytime variant A CTR is the highest, your expected loss is zero. You don't lose anything. Anytime, uh, in that, you know, for any iteration where um, variant A CTR is not the highest, you take the highest CTR from the pool of variants, and then you take the difference between that one and variant A CTR, and then that's the expected loss you'll get in CTR. Uh, for choosing A in that round. And then you just repeat this for multiple rounds, and then you just average the number, you just average the expected losses across all those iterations. And then that's, that's just your expected loss for choosing variant A. And I really like this because um, it looks, it is a CT, like it is a real life interpretable, like intuitive value um, that you get as output. Like, so for example, um, you know, if you, if the expected loss of variant A is, you know, 0.5% CTR, that means your you know, worst case scenario for choosing variant A is that you lose 0.5% to your CTR. So um, for any product managers, this is like a really nice way to like report to them, hey, if you wanna set this threshold of like what the expected loss, loss should fall under, um, just tell me what you think the worst CTR, like the worst drop in CTR we could possibly like, um, like we could possibly accept is, and then I'll just set that as the parameter in the algorithm. So. Um, I mentioned this briefly before, but yeah, this is known as a threshold of caring. This is just the, um, like, this is what your, like, decision threshold is. This is just that, you know, for any variant that you're choosing as the winner, if that variant's expected loss falls below, you know, 0.5% CTR, then, um, then you're good. Then we feel safe. We feel like we, we feel safe about this decision. We feel like we could take on this risk of choosing variant A. Um, yeah, so, you know, an example value is 0.01%, 0.005% for the threshold of caring. And um, if it does not fall below, if none of the variants have an expected loss calculation that falls below this, this threshold of caring, then just keep testing. Keep collecting more clicks and impressions and don't resolve the test yet. Cool, but then, uh, of course, there are scenarios where the, you know, the writer generates some different variants of a title or an image, and they all are almost indistinguishable. They're all very similar. Um, it's funny, because some writers will do this. They'll just have you know, two different title variants that are off by like one preposition, and then they'll think that will make the difference in, in clicks. But that's not the case like for a lot of these times. So um, it is very common that we'll have all these different variants being tested and none of them are significantly different from each other. Um, so this would inevitably lead to an incon inconclusive test. And the way that we would want to handle this is just, you know, we don't want to waste anyone's time by having people wait and wait and wait, uh, like, you know, 12 hours until eventually, uh, or, you know, sometimes they'll have to wait forever because there really is no, there's going to be no difference emerging. Um, so in those cases, we just want to impose a hard limit on, um, on how long this test can run. Or how, so we basically call this like an impression limit. So just, you know, once it exceeds a certain number of impressions exposed to every variant, just cut it off, just resolve to something. Um, and that's easy if they're all tied. If every variant is the same, essentially, um, in their CTRs, then just randomly pick one of them or default to like a pre-designated one that, um, that the writer designated as like the one to default to if nothing gets selected. Okay, so that's simple, right? Um, well, there's also this other scenario that Bayesian A-B testing cannot account for. Um, so these are, this is another tweak that had to be added to the algorithm. Basically, what I, the method I talked about so far will just not resolve if everyone has a tie, and it will resolve if one of them clearly emerges as like be, having a significantly higher CTR than the others. In this case, you know, in this first line, I have A, B, and C. A has definitively higher CTR. It'll probably get chosen as the winner. But what if there's only a clear loser and no clear winner? So in the case of A, B, and C on the second line, A and B are tied for first place, and C is clearly something that should be weeded out of the equation. Um, so in this case, what the algorithm did so far was just resolve to nothing. And I started realizing this once it was, at, once it was actually in production, that this was not cool. 
um, because C is something that needs to be weeded out. And sometimes C was the pre-designated variant that a, a writer chose. So we want to make sure that doesn't, that never gets selected. So in those situations, I just like I just implemented this other requirement that A or B, like in this in cases like these, you just need to make sure that the highest performing variant is better than the lowest performing variant by some ratio, um, and then just choose among the the ties the tied uh, variants that are tied for first place. Um, so that was pretty straightforward. Eventually, everything I discussed so far can be just plotted out into this like pretty basic decision tree, and that's just what the algorithm looked like in the end. And the, algor uh, the algorithm itself that I just discussed for choosing the winner only ended up being like 20 lines. It was very, very tiny. So this was, you know, once I got over that like F my life moment with like the closed form probability formulas, everything was just like smooth sailing, very, very easy. Coding wise, it was just like a piece of cake. So this reduced the resolve time from like on average one day per post to one, one and a half hours. So this was really good for our timeliness goal. But of course this raises a huge question, right? If I'm going to reduce the testing time by this much, the confidence or the, the actual like precision of the output must be terrible, right? It must be like there's this obvious, this obviously something that I'm sacrificing here by reducing this testing time. There must be something we're like completely losing here. Um, so the next major step was to evaluate the actual effectiveness of this algorithm. Did my change actually do anything? Did it make everything worse? Which is very, very probable. So you know, the goal for this whole evaluation process was to try to understand, you know, for every post that used FlexPro, this optimizer, did it perform better than posts that didn't use it? And you know, what was the average impact of it using that? Um, so that was like question one. Question two was a little trickier. It was what was its impact, like what was the impact of using FlexPro, the one that I created, version two, versus the original one, the multi-arm bandit system, right? And I want to make sure that, you know, there was some improvement in, um, in how posts performed by using this version two uh, in comparison to version one. Um, so my hypothesis was that, you know, version two, hopefully, ideally, would be, <coughs> Uh, which was the Bayesian A-B testing version, will perform best in social platform traffic. So the, the type of traffic that was dependent on speed, that was dependent on getting these results uh, decided very fast so that we could publish this on, on social media, on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and, uh, and if it failed at that, then I really like <laughs> failed everything. Um, and then version one, which is the multi arm bandit version, I hypothesized would perform best in on-site views because that's exactly the domain in which it was optimizing for, even though it was uh, taking such a long time. Um, so unfortunately, this was a scenario in which I couldn't use an actual A-B a -B test, which sounds weird because it's very meta because like I'm A-B testing an A-B test service, but it's fine. Um, so the main reason uh, was like, you know, data science wise, the main reason was that you can't really, um, publish a post onto a social platform with two variants of equal exposure with a perfectly uh, well-controlled environment, there was no way to actually test that. Um, and then, you know, another reason was that, this was kind of just like a reason out of my control, but uh, even more so, but it was just, version one was like already dead, so I couldn't, couldn't just reanimate it um, at that point to, for, for comparing against version two. Um, so uh, one, one, one approach uh, one can take is just bucketing all posts that use FlexPro and then bucketing all posts that didn't use FlexPro. Conveniently, only about 50% of posts actually were run through FlexPro. It's really up to the writer of that post. It's their choice. Some just don't trust FlexPro. Some trust it maybe too much. So in that way, we have like a nice like one-to-one -one comparison um, of of posts with FlexPro on and posts with FlexPro off. One can see this as, you know, FlexPro on posts are like your treatment group in like a drug effectiveness study, right? It's the, they were treated with FlexPro. And then you can group all of the ones that didn't use FlexPro, so the FlexPro off group as like your control group, right? Um, so the result of this was, uh, was just like amazing because FlexPro off posts averaged only 56,000 views per post. FlexPro on posts averaged about 231,000. So 
obviously, I had an impact of like fivefold on these posts, right? Flex, you know, the ones that use FlexPro on were guaranteed to have five times the number of views as one that didn't use FlexPro. Um, so, you know, this is demonstrated by this pretty ugly bar graph that I made of uh, where, you know, this towering bar is, you know, represents the average post views that, um, or the total post views that a, a post with FlexPro on would have. And then compare that to this tiny little bar, which is how many views um, posts without FlexPro um, got. Um, so like I said, five-fold improvement. This is amazing. Um, I've like, I've just completely <laughs> excelled in this. But the problem was that, obviously, this was not a causal approach. Um, and you know, at the keynote <laughs> talk this morning, um, they talked at length about how like, causal methods and causal inference is something that should be implemented more often, um, in, especially in my case. So, um, you know, the, the whole point of this is that it's pretty obvious to see why posts that use FlexPro could have such different performance than posts that didn't use it. And it's because it usually varies by who wrote the post. There are some people, like, it's very well known at BuzzFeed, like, who are, like, the hit generators? Who are the people cranking out viral hits for our site every day? Um, and they're really good at it. And um, so, you know, we wanted to make sure that that bias, that confounding was accounted for. And, you know, that also varies by the post category. If it's a news post, if it's a vertical, uh, if it's a quiz post, if it's, you know, a celebrity post, that also varies with, um, you know, the, the writer and the writer's choice to use FlexPro. So, uh, the idea is to just use propensity matching. And the idea is, behind this is to assemble, like, a pseudo-treatment group where these are posts, um, where these are posts that use FlexPro and a pseudo uh, control group where these are posts that didn't use FlexPro, like I mentioned before in the naive approach. Um, but the difference is that you want to reassemble these groups so that every treatment group post has a corresponding um, control group uh, counterpart where both of them have almost a, like equal likelihood to, to use FlexPro. Um, and basically what you want to do once you've assembled these pseudo tests and control groups, you want to measure what was the average number of views um, for the treatment group versus the control group, and that's like the average treatment effect. And um, yeah, so like this is basically like a drug effectiveness study. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone in this drug study in the test group and in the control group are both seeking, uh, both have like equal likelihood of seeking that drug, right? That drug treatment. So you want to make sure that posts in both groups are both equally likely to, to use FlexPro. And so, you know, very easy way to do this. Um, I left out some other features uh, just to like keep this like a little cleaner, but um, you, you know, I used author and vertical as like these confounding features. And then the dependent variable was FlexPro usage, which I call FlexPro on. Um, and then the output, the class probability output that you get from a logistic regression um, it's basically the probability that FlexPro is being used given who the author of that post was and what category that post was. Um, and then, you know, you do this for every treatment group uh, member, every post that used FlexPro, and you just make sure it has a matching counterpart in the control group um, that has equal or similar propensity, uh, which is the probability score from the logistic regression. From here, it's super easy. Um, one way to just estimate the average treatment effect is that you fit a linear regression model. Um, you estimate the number of views as your output uh, based on flex per usage as your first feature, um, and then your confounding features, which are author, vertical, et cetera. And then you just try to get that estimated beta coefficient for flex per usage. Um, and then you just repeat this whole process on like, you know, a thousand bootstrap samples of your data set. Um, so that you can get some confidence intervals on your average treatment effect. And basically, um, you can get these humongous error bars, which is what I got. Um, and, um, you know, just to like quickly go over this plot, the x-axis is the type of view that that post got, like the average, on average, what, um, like what type of view that post got, which was, you know, site views, like I mentioned, just buzzfeed.com views. Uh, BuzzFeed app views, social views, which is any views coming from a social platform, um, and then the total. Um, so, you know, if, when I'm comparing version two to version one, which are these different colored bars, um, very hard to tell which one's better, 
But you could see that the error bars are at least above 0% change in views. Um, so, you know, where the y axis is the impact on post, um, they're all positive, which is good, mostly. Um, and then you also see, as I, as I hypothesized, the Beijing A-B testing uh, version did better for speed um, and for social platform views. So that green bar is a little bit higher than the pink bar there. Um, and then for multi, the multi arm bandit version, it performed better for site views, which was also expected, um, where the pink bar is slightly uh, higher than that orange bar, sorry, the, <laughs> the green bar. Um, so, you know, there was no five fold improvement, but I will accept 1.35 times improvement. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So just a reminder that we have a survey at the table. So if you like the talk, please place one of those green papers in the basket. If you just thought it's OK, then a yellow one, or if you disliked it, a red one. Questions? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I have, I have a couple, but maybe you can just get to one of them. Um, the multi-arm bandit that you used, um, I'm assuming uh, was it, that was like an epsilon greedy type of approach? Or did you do like a Thompson sample? I think it was Thompson sampling. So OK, so yeah. I'm a little bit, uh, I'm just curious as to how, why the differences are so big, because um, I think it's like mm -hmm. a beta posterior, mm -hmm. kind of in the same yeah. way as a Bayesian yeah. A-B test. Yeah. Um, so do like so I guess a like do you have any intuition as to why it was so different? Yeah. Um, and then the 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 other question is um, with this kind of Bayesian approach, um, I think there's it's kind of like well known that it's hard to come up with like a sample size estimate because uh, there isn't really that analog of like power. Um, so I wonder if you guys deal with that or if you get data so quickly that you don't even care, you just you know, you just start running it because you know within hours you're fin you know, you're almost right, finished. Right. Right. Um, and then, and then finally, um, if you ever consider doing like a multinomial Dirichlet uh, kind of approach instead of doing like many betas, um, mm -hmm. and if you have any opinions on that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So first question. Yeah. So okay. So just to preface this, um, that multi-arm bandit version was like coded so many years ago, so I couldn't even get like a glimpse into um, like how exactly it worked, but I think it was Thompson sampling. Um, and I think the, you know, I think for the time, that was like a pretty good solution. We weren't getting as much traffic. Um, we also weren't, yeah, like I said, we didn't care that much about speed of the performance. So I think that was, in the end, yeah, like I could see a lot of ways in which it would theoretically outperform this Bayesian A-B testing approach. But I think the fact that we couldn't tune the parameters to make it faster and to make it like resolve the test much faster, I think was a huge limitation to it. Um, so yeah, this wasn't the fairest comparison of the two, but I think that was one thing that, one like constraint to keep in mind um, to why it underperformed. Um, uh, and then I guess to answer your second question, the sampling, um, yeah, we, we get traffic like very fast on our website. So, um, you know, I did some like preliminary analysis just to understand like what that traffic distribution looks like. Um, and it was just like, it was a very safe bet to, you know, just know that we'll get like a thousand impressions in like less than an hour. So, um, yeah, so that, that was something that I did keep in mind. Um, and then your third question, no, I did not look into that as a solution. Um, this was just like, a, just like hack this together really fast kind of thing, so. You can kind of do, like, can't you just find the maximum of them? Um, cause you have a, cause that would, that would be the, that, that's the generalization of the beta binomial? Well, that, uh, the
Other questions? Okay, I'm coming. So I'm curious, do, uh, do writers ever ask for introspection on the results? Which is to say, uh, I imagine that sometimes they're curious why a particular variant wins over another. Um, does that happen and what do you mm -hmm. tend to say to them? Yeah, um, so that's also like the, half the purpose of the service is just like as like a feedback loop for the writers um, to just like extract whatever insights they want from it. Um, so to that end, we built a Slack bot for them that just like automatically surfaces all the results of every experiment. So they could read results for their own, their own posts as well as results for their um, coworkers' posts. So yeah, they definitely get a lot of value out, uh, out of that. Uh, hello, I had a question uh, here. Oh. <laughs> so I was interested like how the variants are generated. So are those generated from the input of the writer or are those are those like auto-generated from the article itself? Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, how are the headlines, like the variants, right, you just uh, talked about, how are those generated? Are those like input of the writers or is it like auto-generated from the text itself? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's written by the, the authors. So basically they give like two, three variants, they think yeah. best of and the FlexPro evaluates which one is better. Yeah, yeah. So that did, yeah, so they, they input it. But that did inspire a fun pr pet project of like auto-generating yeah. ideal headlines based on which ones perform better. Um, it's something um, we worked on for like a Hack Week project once. Um, but, you know, needless to say, it didn't beat, uh, you know, a real human, human writer. Yeah. So.